Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 123. In this episode, I interview Mr. Nice Guy. He has been gardening for five years and is big into DIY gardening. He has created his own DIY hydroponic setup at home. He talks all about the hydroponic setup and how he grows in it. He also talks about some common problems and solutions. And he reveals a lot of great advice when it comes to growing hydroponically. If you want to see short, bite-sized clips of these episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. I also have a gardening channel where I have over 130 videos showing the plants that I've grown. I'll have both of those channels linked down in the YouTube description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AEC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their Ion Frame LED grow lights, which have the latest Samsung Evo LEDs. These grow lights include a schedule controller that features 10 brightness levels, dimming, and a sunrise sunset feature. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about their Ion Frame LED grow lights. And the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Happy Hydro. They have some of the best complete beginner grow kits on the market today. Their kits include a grow tent, grow light, ventilation system, grow pots, soil, nutrients, and more. They have 36 different kits in their beginner category and also have advanced kits, cheap kits, and kits that include an auto watering system. Go to happyhydro.com, link in the description, and use the discount code MrGrow during checkout to save on your order. Stash Blend. Stash Blend is a 215 plant additive that can be used with synthetic bottled nutrients or in living soil systems. Simply mix half teaspoon of Stash Blend into a gallon of water, then water your plants with it. Ingredients include corn steep liquor, seaweed extract, humic acid, beneficial bacteria, silica, and mycorrhizal fungi. Check it out at stashblend.com, link in the description section below, and use the discount code the stash. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Mr. Nice Guy. How are you doing today? Hey, how's it going, Chris? Good, good. Thanks for coming on. Did you happen to get your name from that 1997 Jackie Chan movie, Mr. Nice Guy, where the <laughs> Chinese chef accidentally gets involved with a news reporter who filmed a drug bus that went airy and is now being chased by gangs who are trying to get the videotape? Um, Read that plot right then and there. <laughs> pretty, pretty close on the genre, at least. I mean, it was in the 90s, but I don't know if you've seen Half, Half Baked, maybe, but uh, the delivery yeah. service was uh, Mr. Nice Guy Deliveries. Kind of stole it off them. Oh, that's funny. That's where you got it from. Well, thanks for coming on to the podcast today. We're going to talk all about hydroponics, which is really your bread and butter, DIY. Let's get into all of that. You have a lot of experience there. Can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Um, yeah, most definitely. If anything, um, uh, my background isn't too, like, uh, let's say, uh, focused on, on like horticulture or, or, or growing or anything like that. Um, rather, if it is DIY, I, I learn and do a lot of research between what I know and I can apply it. So a lot of my experience from work, not to mention I, I grew up, you know, at a young age working like you know, construction, asphalt, framing. I did a lot of a lot of different like physical kind of jobs uh, growing up. So I've used that to apply it to you know nowadays I'm gardening and uh, fixing my house. <laughs> um, I, I grew up here in Cali, Southern California. So you can imagine um. The weather is not, not too crazy, but it does kind of shift up, up and down. I mean, like I mentioned, um, uh, a lot of my DIY goes into my, my experience through life. And uh, I mean, I, I've been working on cars, computers, you know, electronics ever since I was a little kid, kind of mentioning and applying that where I need it and where it can be uh, used most efficiently. Um, I, I look up to growers like yourself on YouTube uh, ever since I started, um, Mr. Canuck, I don't know if you watch Debaco or, I mean, we love Mr. Bugby, if anything, <laughs> kind of on my feet on a daily. Um, so I, I'm an everyday learner. So if I could apply it to what I, you know, love as a hobby or, you know, as a grower or gardener that I, I try to, you know, be the best I can. I mean, when it comes to gardening, um, I guess I really started gardening when I first purchased my home. That was a few years ago, I mean, with my wife and we have a lot of, you know, backyard space to do so. Uh, we have avocados, we've even tried growing watermelons, potatoes, 
assortment of um, tomatoes, if you want to call that, if kids love doing that. My, my daughter loves picking those and growing them herself. I have a mandarin tree. I'm trying to grow a lemon tree so I can have the necessity, you know. <laughs> Every, uh, everyone's backyard, a, a kind of dream for that same reason. And then I have my, my seasonal medicinal plant that's outside. Uh, for the most part, it's kind of derivative of my indoor stuff that I have, and I push it out there when the season's right. And now what would you say is your overall style of gardening? Are you indoor, outdoor, organics, synthetics, soil, cocoa? What's your style? Uh, well, I would imagine my, my style of gardening would pertain mostly to indoor hydroponics, um, where I use different methods of growing for different growth stages. Uh, yeah, I, use co- I use cocoa, rock wool, hydrogen. I also use synthetic blends, um, especially since they're, uh, it's a hydroponic uh, system. It needs to be clean and can't have too many things in it to build up the algae or, or film and you know, causing the flow to stop going one way or the other. Um, I, I work a lot with uh, a recirculating system, so I, I need the flow to be constant and consistent. Uh, let me see here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to maintain a perpetual grow. So I have two different tents indoors. I have like my seedlings, my my cuts, my fresh cuts. I have on one side, and when they're rooted enough and big enough to move over to the to my bigger tent I, or my my next tent over, and I have my end stages of like vegetation and and flowering at, at the end of the, in, in there at least, and repeat the process that I take cuts that I need and get tired of the the cultivar. I kind of go on the search for another mother, you know. So mostly hydroponics indoors. Perfect. That's exactly what we're talking about today. And I know you like to get into the DIY side of things. You built your own DWC system. Let's break it down a little bit for the beginners first. Some people not, might not know what DWC is or also are DWC. Can you explain what both of those things are? Well, um, DWC or you know, deep water culture, more or less a form of hydroponics similar to like, I don't know if you're, you're I know you're familiar with the cracky method. The uh, you know, simple thing is like having a jar and you know, roots are hanging into the water and it kinda depletes the nutrients as it grows. Um a deep water culture is more passive. Uh or le- less passive, uh, for that same reason. It, it requires that you, you implicate oxygen so you can add uh, add to the roots for that same reason and you know, that's kinda of the difference between overwatering your plants and underwatering them. And it's definitely capable of doing so in within deep water culture as well. Um, in a nutshell, the plant is suspended in a neutral, like medium, uh, with its roots mostly hanging out in the container uh, to take the nutrient water up. And at the same time, you have, like I mentioned, some oxygen um, being aerated up from the, maybe a, a like an air stone, or depending on how big you have your setup, it's to draw some micro bubbles up there and, and then keep the keep the oxygen going, and keeping the plant healthy, and giving it some uh, some air to breathe. And then differ to maybe a uh, res- uh, RDWC, a recirculating deep water culture. Um, in my, let's say, uh, situation, I have like a kind of three three plant uh, setup where I have all the buckets kind of interconnected with uh, PVC tubing. That'll give it a nice flow between all, all the same water flowing between the three plants. It'll make it so I don't have to refill or maintain individually those plants, those same plants. Um, and to be honest, like, you know, when you're doing like a deep water culture or like, you know, something that's all connected, you want to kind of keep to the same kind of like plant or cultivar, uh, just so it doesn't get too, they're not too, in, too different uh, in grow, growth rate or like things you have to kind of like, uh, like, let's say, maybe manipulate the, the different nutrients that you have for a plant. So some, some plants like, uh, they're, they're very temperamental, you know this, and depending on where they come from, they have different, uh, let's say, uh, means to uptake nutrients. I mean, for the most part, the two biggest differences between the deep water culture and, you know, re- recircling is, the, is the, the passing of the water between the tubes. I mean, it can be anywhere from, you know, simple, like, uh, vinyl tubing, or you can go PVC tubing. I mean, nice and setups where they have anywhere from in-stick in, in to uh, pipes to like three inches. So um, you can go anywhere from there. To be honest, it, it's not the biggest difference if you have a such smaller setup, but the, the higher flow would be kind of, it will circulate a lot of the nutrients and keep it like not idle. It won't be sitting there and kind of like building up film or anything of this sort. And that's not usually the case with like deep water culture. Usually the water is like fluctuating a lot. <laughs> Got it. And so arguably, 
our DWC is a little bit easier for the regions you mentioned. Now uh, there's a you know reservoir and things are recirculating through multiple plants, and you really just have that one control versus DWC kind of like individual buckets, right? And you got to fill up individual buckets and, and manage the nutrients for each individual plant. But like you mentioned, it has a downsides for a recirculating system. If you've got all different cultivars in there and they have kind of different nutrient uptake, it can be finicky, right? You can have some plants that are perfectly healthy and others that are deficient. So yeah, there's definitely some pros and cons to both of those methods. And that's pretty cool that you do the RDWC method. And I know that you actually built your own setup can you talk to us about the, the DIY hydroponic recirculating system that you set up? Well, for my setups, for the most part, I, I like to have a basis and, you know, before I build, so I can have some expectations at the end. Um, a lot of it does pertain to budget and the space to have to work with, and more or less trying to maximize the, the usages of what I have already and what I need to get. With my 2x4 design, um, I designed a uh, like you mentioned, a three-plan RDWC system. Um, I also kind of implicated a waterfall to get like top roots cut with top roots some some moisture as well. Uh, those are kind of like a like an idea of a bubble bubble ponics kind of a system where you have a waterfall and then you give some uh, nutrients to the top roots so they can expand through the oxygen gap between the, the bubbles coming from the bottom of the water. So you don't essentially don't want to fill up your, your water too high. I have a four, like a, a four gallon bucket. I, I merely fill it up like a third. And then it, it kind of, all the moisture hits the roots anyways, and, the, and there's very little dry back. Uh, the basics to some, some deep water cultures require a reservoir, depending on how you go about adding your nutrients. I personally deleted my reservoir and even my chiller for, for more space within my room. Um, but depending on your situation, I know it's kind of humid where you stay. Water temperatures might be like, you know, kind of kind of up there. <laughs> uh, so I can imagine using a chiller would be more optimal for you guys. Um, unfortunately, I didn't need that. So I kind of pulled it, saved some electricity and, and uh, the extra, you know, computer tower. <laughs> That to sit uh, on the outside of my tents, but here in Cali, um, we're I'm, I'm pretty good with my water temps at mid 60s sometimes. I mean, the colder the better, not too cold, but the colder roots, the, the better the uptake from, for the most part. Like I was mentioning earlier about space management, so I, I do a lot of measurements. I make sure everything does fit, uh, especially with the buckets. Uh, they're not easy to find for, like, let's say. Uh, um, aside from commercial use, you have to go far and wide trying to find these buckets with their proper lids if they don't already come with them. I use Uline. Um, they do sell a lot of commercial materials for like, you know, job sites and this and that, but you know, anybody can purchase it regardless of your status of wholesaler or, or being in business. Um, to be honest, I, I found my buckets at Home Depot. <laughs> they were uh, they were sitting on a stack. I guess they were um, putting flowers in them. and. And like they were there to take, so I'm like, oh, can I have these? Uh, I'm gonna use them for a project. I'm like, yeah, I take a few if you want. They're essentially trash, but there's some nice black buckets that I found lids on Uline for, and I drilled out some holes, um, added a, a netting pot on there to, to hold my uh, my rock wool, my essentially the plant that's gonna be you know, growing in there for the rest of its life. And by the way, my my netting pots are anywhere from like eight inches, pretty big ones that sit halfway through the bucket, and I mean, great expansion for my roots. And the rock will cook, opens up pretty well. I fill the gaps with um, with um, hydrogen, and it does pretty well with the, the drainage for that same reason. And as for like the uh, the flow, I I've gone from tubing, vinyl tubing, to PVC piping. I found different um, outlets to on um, on Uline and even Amazon for that same reason too. Kind of build it properly, make sure everything fits. And for the same reason, you you don't want to make build something like this and not be sure that's not going to fail. <laughs> the worst thing in the world is a water leak midway through your your grow, and you have to like flush and then re redo it all over again, dismantle it, and find your leak, seal it, and go for it. That's that's kind of the nightmare of a sort of hydroponics or, or deep water culture. It's like filling the bottom of your your tent with with uh, with water, <laughs> getting that vacuum out. You mentioned four gallon buckets. Why four gallon? Would it be better with a larger bucket, uh, smaller? Why, why four? 
Um, it really, really depends on, like, again, the spacing that you have. Um, the taller the bucket, uh, I probably wouldn't mind too much, but the, the four gallon bucket um, height is anywhere from like a, a, a foot and a quarter up, and then they're like maybe 10 inches wide. So it's a great fit um, for giving the space for the plant to grow upwards, and it doesn't take too much space uh, around it. So I can have piping and um, other things like different fans and uh, maybe a pump for my water within the tent, more or less a cleaner area. Now, are you ever concerned of the roots kind of filling up that space? How do you know, like, I guess, plant size to bucket size? That's kind of like a blessing in, um, you know, uh, <laughs> in, in the, a situation all in itself. Because, like, the more roots, definitely you want to get, everyone wants roots. You want to fill your, even in soil, you want to fill your bucket, your, uh, your pot over roots as much as you can. At the same time, we... I have my my water flowing through one another, and uh, these roots can get clogged within those pipes. And at the same time, that's why people have bigger pipes, so the roots don't kind of like clog up and and affect the, the next the next pot over. Um, but yeah, that's that's about all in itself. So like, you want the bigger roots, but at the same time, you don't want clogs either because you need that water to flow and not overflow at the same time. My um. My drip, it's taken out of the um, one of the same buckets that's connected. So it's taking water from the bottom and throwing it on top of each of the of the other bottom um, buckets. So it's this is going to overflow if I have one on the clock at the same time. So maintaining them is it's definitely a good idea. Keep an eye on them. Got it. That makes sense. And then what size tubing or, or PVC? And how do you kind of determine that? I know you said you're using a four gal. Like what size tubing for the four gal? And then is it? go by number of plants to the size tubing? Does that relate at all or, or no? With this, my most uh, recent um, build, it, it was availability. Um, and I would have definitely went bigger tubing. I, I personally have it at uh, an inch and a half, um, almost two inches. So um, I would definitely have gone to two or three, but the second part that's needed wasn't always available. So the knuckle that I, I, I thread the PVC into, I didn't have the other part to go for, go bigger than what I had. So it's, I'm dealt those cards, so I kind of make the best of it, if anything. But I hope they have a three-inch like uh, threaded uh, knuckle that I can add to my next setup. I definitely would go bigger, for that same reason with the roots and, and the clogging issues. Um, ABS maybe um, it's, it's black versus white. It's, it'll take in less less lighting and no buildup of like algae between the tubes. It's thick enough, I believe. So I, I personally haven't come across it with this tube, but you will with vinyl all day. Okay, good to know. And then reservoir, if I know you said you're not running a reservoir, but for those that are looking to run a reservoir, how do they determine what size to use? Reservoir space. Um, personally, I have, when I did have my reservoir, it was, it was great to have it um, to the left of my, or whatever, whichever side of my tent. Um, with that reservoir out there, you're going to have to find a means to uh, run a line. And you can't run lines uh, horizontally or or you know, at an angle or anything like this for that same reason, you need to have it level to the ground so the water can flow. And a lot of these tents aren't made with like, you know, outlets at the bottom of the, of the tent. They're usually like, you know, have a foot up for like, you know, ducts or, or, or cables. So you're going to have to punch some holes to the bottom of your tent and, you know, kind of modify it. Uh, an outlet so you can find a side for your reservoir and as for the size of it it really depends on and how much you want to like uh, suspend for your tanks to use so it's a reservoir and then like like a an automatic fill so when your reservoir starts losing water it starts refilling from the top bucket um, and those go anywhere from like 10 15 gallons uh, they're, they're convenient as hell, really. You don't have to go inside your tent. Um, you, your, your refills are much easier. Um, I want to say maybe your flushing would probably be more of a pain and kind of clearing out, you know, an extra bucket, um, especially if your, your grow is more compact. But um, I, again, I, I, I always look for, you know, more efficiency for my turn and, you know, how much more easier it would be. And even if it's the same, same idea or outcome, I'm, I'm probably going to go for the, the latter end. And then can you talk to us about like pump size, like if somebody's building their own system and I don't know, whether it be a four plant system or eight plant system, like how do they determine what pump size 
and how many air stones to kind of put in each bucket? Um, to, to be honest, I, I've always found myself always going bigger the better for, for some things that, or um, the better quality and, and brand for that same reason. But there's definitely a, a minimum of like, let's say, um, free air pump. I, I have a, a three plant system with six inch uh, flat air stones and I have one commercial pump with outlets running for all of them. Um, there's, there's definitely smaller versions of them less loud or more loud for that. Um, it really depends on your situation. Um, General, General Hydroponics, they, they make some simple pumps with like pre-lit outlets. Amazon has several pumps that, um, that are really affordable and, and they come with outlets too. And, and not, you know, to be honest, they're not as bad. They're, they're just a name really. They're all pretty remade in the same place. Um, but I, I personally use a commercial one. It's, it's yay big. and. It's very quiet. It has some rubber like like feet, so it kind of vibrations go off the floor. Um, it, it runs twenty four hours. I've been running it for several years now. <laughs> Didn't spend too much on it. Um, again, it's one of those things I, I was able to purchase. Like um, I think someone had it used, a uh, uh, fallout on someone on Instagram or not Instagram on uh, offer up. You know, um, growers fall out all the time and they kind of give up on a hobby and. I come up on some of these products. Uh, here in California, we have shops that close down on, on, on the regular and turn around and have to sell their their materials and, and like, uh, you know, parts. And that's me picking it up on the other end if I could uh, find it, you know. <laughs> so you mentioned 8-inch net pots is what you have within the buckets. You use rock wall and then hydroton surrounding it. Can you talk to us about kind of using the rock wall from start to finish? Do you start cuts in it and then kind of have it in your seedling area and then switch it over to the bucket? Or how do you go about that? Um, I, I believe Rockwell has gone a long way, <laughs> especially with tech. Um, uh, there's a brand, Grodan. Um, they're, they're kind of uh, big on, on their products, but they, they make different versions. I mean, everyone makes Rockwell, but they uh, actually use their, their plugs and their four inch cubes. I've big, used bigger ones for it to, to kind of experiment, but it's not really necessary if, unless you're going to do like a drip to drain kind of like setup. But um, I start with plugs. Um, they're, they're, let's see here. Or, you know, small little cubes. Um, and these are, I insert them into uh, another four inch cube as I go. So my seedlings and my, uh, my fresh cut clones, I, I, I drop them in there and kind of, uh, uh, dome them up in my in my tent and get some humidity to let them get rooted first. And once they're rooted and I get stuff poking out of them, I, I drop them into another, like, you know, pH ready, like a uh, four inch cube. So let that sit in there for a minute. And um, after a couple of weeks, it gets pretty rooted up. I then attract, like, once it's kind of vegetated to a team, more or less, a couple of feet, I, I bring over to the, to the next tent over and, and get a final. A couple of weeks of vegging so the roots can expand and, and run the flower. Like I mentioned earlier, they, they go into the, the pots and um, they kind of I kind of fill the gaps with the, the hydrogen. Um, the, the hydrogen is great for drainage. Um, at the same time, it, it, it's more or less, it's real comparable to a terracotta pot. So they're, they're able to absorb a lot of moisture and at the same time, like you mentioned, the drainage between it being a pebble lets it flow right through. So I get all right drybacks and then greater uptake between like you know nutrients what do you use for a nutrient lineup currently um for actually like, last couple of years i've been using um athena uh they've been pretty consistent not rocky at all really from from day one I, I, i've been pretty uh haven't really dropped the ball like everything that i put in there it works pretty to to its word <laughs> um follow the instructions the guidelines and and if I really wanted to, I'm, I've tried experimenting, like bumping up ratios, see if it kind of you know messes with the plant or if, if they like it a little bit more. But I got to different PPMs between in flower stages, and they can go pretty high. Um, uh, if you harden your plants well enough, they can take they can take a lot of salt um, yeah, for that same reason. Um, like I, I go by PPM, I, I really don't go by. Um, EC. I, I, I'm a numbers guy, so I like seeing the numbers that uh, break down pretty to detail. And EC is like two points, and I, I can't really break that down or divide them into you know, my nutrients that I've mixed into it most recently. But um, I, I love it, you know. If, if anything, I'm, I'm thinking of moving over to their, um, their salt mix. 
if I ever expand my op and, and you know, need more liquid for that same, same part of it. Um, but I come from other nutrients like Psycho. Um, even like, uh, uh, Psycho is good. It's not, it's, you now really, to be honest, a lot of these nutrients aren't bad at all. None of them are. It's, it's just really their ratio and how they formulate them to, for these plants to work. And, you know, everybody knows these plants are different. So they're going to take up these nutrients differently. And then that's up to the, to the grower, the gardener, to kind of like fine tune that, their ratios and, and give the plant what they like. So, you know, a lot of these companies are not mentioning, like, here, this is yours. You do with it what you will, or, and you figure it out. But, you know, they want to make it easy. I mean, they, they have their charts and to, to, uh, to a basis, it works. But to make it better, it's, it's really up to the grower. Um, and that goes with a lot of our variables, you know, conditions, lighting, and, and exactly what the plant may prefer. But, um, I run Athena, and hopefully I can keep on doing it. I've heard a lot of good things about Athena. A lot of people seem to be jumping over to Athena and using them just because of the results that you see people getting out of them. And um, I heard a lot of the good things about ease of use. They make it really easy to use. Now, you mentioned PPM. Are you talking 500 scale or 700 scale? And also, are you adjusting the PPM that you have that you're giving to your plants throughout the growth cycle so it gets higher as you go from veg to flower? Or how do you go about that? I go 500 um, for the scale, if anything, and um, yeah, by stage, I, I try to pay, uh, pay attention to, to what the plant is like and how they react, uh, if, they're, if they're praying at the time of, with, with enough heat. Um, it really, it does fluctuate from vegetation to, to flowering. Um, when I find that within flowering, you know, they're, they're lacking a little bit, I kick down some things so, so they can pick up, but if, if they're really liking it, I do add. I add and I add. <laughs> Until until I see a, a, a lacking, um, if if they start showing some some bad signs, a different takeaway. But um, I haven't actually. So I, I've heard other growers go, um, you know, several thousand um, in ppm, like you know, three thousand ppm to to a point of like you know, you don't even imagine that for your plants and how they can really uptake it. But if you have the right setup and your and your roots are really clean, if if they're big enough and they're able to uptake, they will. Um, and then, you know, finding that plant, finding that mother that, you know, is suitable for such conditions is, is the, you know, part of the journey. Definitely between my growth cycles, uh, I try to up as much so they can take as much nutrients um, for that same reason. More or less towards the end, I try to be real more critical and kind of sensitive to seedlings and even teens at some points because they're not, they're not, I'm not giving them the full effect until they really sit up, step into the flowering stage, um, especially with their lacking root expansion. Okay. And then are you changing nutrient? Is it every week where there's kind of like a new ratio that you're kind of increasing week by week? And when you do that change, are you doing any type of like is cleaning of the buckets or anything with any cleaning solution or are you just rinsing them out with water and then putting in the next week's nutrient mix in? With, with my water, at least <clears throat> I use purified water like everyone should. Um, unfortunately, I don't have like a purifying system. Um, which I should actually. Every hydroponics person should have a filtration system, especially if you're growing. Uh, clean water is is necessary, especially if you're drinking or consuming anything from it. Um, my water is uh, between my buckets and and more or less flushing between uh, between cycles. I d definitely do that. So if I'm ever going from vegetation to clearly to veg to a you know a flowering or fruiting stage. All that water is going out, being dumped into my outdoor grows and reused one way or the other. The, the buckets are then like rinsed out with that same water, again thrown into the, the outside grow stuff. Um, I don't do full flushes, um, if that's one of the questions, I'm sorry. Um, towards the end, um, with, with what research I've learned, I mean, even Bruce Bugby it was like, I mean, there's no results after the fact, you're kind of deteriorating doing that even the, the the three days after uh after um that flush um a lot of this bro science is kind of going out the door and um it's, it's initially when i started growing I, I try to like throw that use to all the stuff that i can imagine that you know would make my plant um bigger or or more uh, or go more vigorously a lot of it wasn't consistent enough for me to continue to keep on doing it so really i'm just following directions into what my nutrient line asked for and um, if it does require that I, f I flush, 
uh, it, it hasn't really, but there, there are definitely things to do. So there's, there, that, there's definitely means to flush aside from pulling out, you know, uh, excess nutrients from your plants. Um, if you're changing up from different cycles, like I mentioned, you definitely want to have uh, a, a clean a clean start and not have anything behind that can mix into what you're putting in new. Um, if you, if I find that there's something lacking within the, my my mix, I'll I'll get runoff, test the runoff, and see how that how that is, how it looks on my uh, my tester, um, opposed to how it's running within the system. Um, this may kind of confuse a lot of people when when they're testing water that's inside the system because the air stone kind of makes pH levels fluctuate. So you know, pull your water out, test it, test a runoff. Don't test don't test your stuff in motion because a lot of it running around is, is going to mess with your testers and it'll it'll kind of mess you up on paper. Um, but yeah, from my last question, I, I raised up my my nutrient levels, my my PPM between cycles. With that being said, I, I don't want to mess mess up my numbers that I already put down and, and kind of add to another one. I, I will top off my levels with the same nutrients as they're growing, um, and, but I, I don't mix uh, different nutrients to uh, to fill it up. Uh, it's definitely flushed out and we start fresh when we go to a new cycle. Got it. Now you mentioned you use that nutrient solution on your outdoor plants. Now how do you get it from, a uh, pretty basic question here, but what do you use to get it from your grow tent that are in the buckets on the floor of the grow tent? How do you get that out into your yard? Are you using a, a shop vac or are you using a sub pump? Like, how do you remove the water from the buckets? Uh, that I mean, essentially, initially that was a, a big, uh, you know, a big question in my head to kind of transfer a lot of liquid. Um, I, I've got myself some some bigger like um, containers, blue containers. Um, to, to fill the liquid with, but at the same time, yes, I, I do use a shop vac, a, a wet, wet dry vac, and I, I pull out all the water, and then it's another another breakdown between the system and having to pull it out and rinse it out really quickly. The rinsing is, is a good thing, and I, I, I really promote the, the whole rinsing part of it because if you don't want any clogs, you don't want any leaks, you want to make sure that your system is still consistent to, to work the next cycle and, 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 you know, longer. My drip system, it clogs a lot. The, the sedative, the, the sediment from the, the salt buildup. Um, I mean, the only way to clear that stuff the lines is, is, is uh, an, another solution to add to your, to your, um, your water, which you don't want to do. You don't want to add a, a solution to clear your lines that's going to also go into your plants. Um, I mean, take it out and do it in another, another time and you know, keep it running as you can. And as my plants are suspended out, out of the water while I'm cleaning, they're, I mean, they're, they're getting dried back. And, they're still wet. Nothing happens to them. They're still in their light. Uh, but maintaining is a big deal, especially with you know anything hydroponic, any any system that you want to run consistently, like a car. You want to make sure that car has gas and oil. You want to make sure your your system is clean and 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 clear of uh, salts. Um, the buildup does happen, I and mean, everything is dirty. You wash your dishes for a reason. <laughs> you don't want to wash your 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 pots or your your buckets from the same things you're going to eat off of. That makes sense. So we talked about PPM, but we didn't talk about pH yet. Can you talk about pH a little bit, like what you typically aim for on a week-to-week basis? I'm always trying to sit between a six and a half and at most seven um, when it comes to my, 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 my hydro water flowing. Um, I always start at a zero, um, a, a zero like uh, PPM when, when I have fresh water and it's always tested and, and mixed in before I drop it all in there. Um, I buffer my pH with uh, um, with Athena's balance, so so anything that has uh, silica in it will kind of raise your pH, and you can work it out from there. So you're always adding your silica first, um, and then building out from there, and then kind of fine tuning between where you want to be at on, on your pH and your PPM. Um, I mean, I go pretty light with my uh, my seedlings and and anything of vegetation. Um, more or less, I just want to keep keep my my veg stuff like consistent, and and and, and expand on root zones and then move it over. So when it comes to like my pH, it does definitely needs to be consistent because um, in my my veg tent everything is um, is pure rock wool. It's all like uh, uh, feed feed the drain, so they're sitting in trays. So I gotta pay attention. Though I see those guys every day. I want to make sure that dry back is not too long and, and they're able to like open up their roots and. 
uh, for the same part, like lighting isn't building too much algae on anything. So maintaining maintaining that is is kind of revolves around the pH because if something else goes bad, it may fluctuate the pH, and then I have to flush that. And it's even more difficult when you're working with a rock roll. You're, you can't really flush the rock roll uh, unless you sit it over water for <laughs> countless times, and and that's a big headache. You almost want to start over again and just you know pull it out and drop it in another queue, but you know it, it's definitely not as easy as you think. <laughs> Got it. Now on the topic of DIY, you also created a DIY double trellis net. Can you talk to us how you went about doing that? A net, yeah. Um, that actually spanned from one of my one of my first couple of grows. Uh, I had a bigger ten. Um, it was a five by five instead of my two by fours. I broke it down too. I I kind of saw um, an example from like Mr. Canuck when I was watching his videos. A lot of it, he gets really really tall plants. Um, but they're always flopping around. <laughs> um, even if he has a single tre- trellis, and it, they just flop around. So, I mean, I imagine, like, why not have a double trellis? Run one, and then when it surpasses that one, run the second one. I mean, you're always going to have stragglers at the bottom that you're going to want to, like, kind of move over to the corner or to a point where you have lighting. I-, I know nowadays there's a lot of, like, side lights or stuff you can add to the bottom of your tent to to add, um, a- add some sun, but... Um, not everyone has that same thing, so you got you want to train. I'm I'm big on training, and it comes to like um, putting positioning your plants, or or even like kind of like bonsaiing them to a point where they they, they lay down lay down on you. You know, my first grow, I had one plant that was you know filled the whole five by five uh, tent, and I was running that double trellis where I can get them laying sideways um, toward the end of the the other end of the plant and. It grew out big. It was, <laughs> it was my first grow, and I, I put like slightly little than five hundred, or and I had. I mean, I still have a little bit left over from <laughs> years ago, if anything. But uh, the the trellis net is definitely it's definitely a big help. Um, PVC piping. It's lightweight. It's it's really like flexible. You can put it and move around as you please. Um, just be good with your measurements. Uh, you know, materials aren't too costly when it comes to things like that. Uh, I, the reason I built my own, I mean, not stacking two on top of one another, it's another cost-effective kind of thing. I mean, if you notice how much these things cost a line, they're, you're mostly paying for the shipping. I, I, for instance, I, I love Gorilla Go 10. And clear, they, they sell everything nowadays. It's like um, AC Infinity. They, they're a kind of one-stop shop. I, I Gorilla Grow 10 is here in California. <laughs> I want. I wanted to buy a twenty dollar trellis net, and it was another like you know twenty five or thirty dollars to ship it over to me. I'm like, can I pick it up? It's right here in Los Angeles. I'm like, unfortunately, no, we can't. So um, that was my turnaround to go to Home Depot. It was like another less five miles, and you know, go build my own with some string. Um, or you can go go on Amazon, and pick up the trellis net, and and run it over some a frame of your own. Uh, it's it's pretty basic, but I mean, it goes without saying. Like, you really just have to put yourself forward and have to, you know, want to make these things and not have to wait for shipping or you know, paying someone else to make it for you. And I, I kind of pushed that, uh, you know, across across the board. We've seen a lot of things I do, whether it's growing or fixing a car. <laughs> if I can't fix it, if I don't know 100 percent sure, I'm not going to do it. But if I can, I'm going to attempt. But you know, without any loss for the most part. You can certainly save a bunch of money doing it DIY, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people go go for it. You know, not just because they're good with their hands, but because it's going to save them money as well. So for these, the PVC double trellis, what size PVC? And then when you're connected them, and they have what's it called, the elbow pieces? Are you putting any? Is there any like glue or any sealant or anything that connects the two to make sure everything locks in place or what? It really depends on you. Um, if you wanted to have like a permanent fixture, yeah, there, there is a PVC adhesive that specifically for, for PVC so the plastic can stick to one another. Um, and then they also have um, like threaded joints that you can get where you can just, you know, more screw them in there and then reuse them again later. I, I prefer more like the threaded joints. So if you ever wanted to break down that same uh, trellis, you can. Um, and I did that same thing. Um, I had a, a big 5x5 five five trellis. I, I broke down and I I made a three by three trellis to fit a shower grow, um, and I just moved it around. I, I try to reuse as much as I can, and I mean I may not have a five by five in there, but you know now I have another opportunity to use it for my a uh, small three by three. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's uh, 
For putting it together, it's really to your spec. So if you find on reusing it, don't go the permanent route. Shoot for threaded, like and screw it in and unscrew it. And if you find that you're gonna, it's something going to be a staple within that same tin, that's not going to change. Go ahead and get an adhesive. Um, it smells at first, but it's non-toxic. It's not going to bother your plants. Um, um, it's, it'll set it and you can forget it for the most part. Good to know. And then for the actual thread that is run, the ones I've seen online of people doing it, they're basically just taking screws and then putting it into the side of the PVC at a certain spacing. And then they're using the, the twine or a string and running it up and down, up and down to make squares. Is that pretty much how you do it? Or like, what's your method of, of that part? I want to say my, my Mark I, my, my first prototype, I definitely did the whole eyelet screws into the, into the PVC. It definitely is um, more tedious of work. You also have to make sure your measurements are on point with how, how big you want the squares. So when I might double trellis, I, I did like a, a four inch square to a six inch square. So it can kind of like open up between, you know, how, how it expands. Um, with the eyelid screws that you're going to put in there, you're, you're kind of going to have to play Spider-Man and, and go end to end. And if, you know, one line kind of is loosened, then you're going to have like a floppy area for that same reason. Um, I found that getting the, the nylon ones on, on Amazon are just as good. And you're going to find that zip ties are going to be your best friend. <laughs> and that goes across the board, too, between your whole grove. Zip ties are, are, are a savior. Get that zip tie and just ratchet it on there um, between the, the right the right net. And you can modify the net as big as it is and cut it. No big deal. Those things are like 7 bucks on Amazon. Um, people also use, like, you know, wood they, for their framing, like 2 by 4s I mean, they have to screw it more properly. It's not like weight. But I like hanging my, my trellis from, from the top of my tent so I can kind of like adjust it as I please. That makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like it's a lot easier to just buy the, the nylon net and then zip tie it to the PVC piping. Save a bunch of time there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and headaches, yeah. So for all these DIY projects, you know, whether it be the hydroponic setup you have or the DIY double trellis, what are some of the problems that you've come across and how did you resolve them? You've already kind of come talked a little bit about the water leak and, and clogged pipes. Not sure if you can expand on that at all, or if there's anything else that comes to mind. And to be honest, those are kind of the biggest nightmares: the the leaks and not being around when the leak happens. Um, I mean, there's several things that could happen between uh, a hydroponic setup because um, you get to a point where you want a lot of things to be automated. So. If, if you want to set it and forget it, walk out of the room and make sure everything's still running, it's, you want to make sure everything's confirmed working. Um, to walk out of the room and then you get a power outage and now all of a sudden, you know, half your pumps aren't going, your, your, your roots are sitting in water uh, for this amount of time and it, it's so idle and it's just built up bacteria that you don't want. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a crucial you know hold down for you uh, when, when you come back to a room that's not on anymore and you have to run a breaker in the back to turn it back on some people aren't keen to those things they're like then they're freaking out and, like they're calling all their friends and like shit my power's off how you turn it back on um i mean there's there's several things um power running out uh, weather conditions california is pretty pretty upset in weather it kind of changes every day i'm lucky to have the sun out today but like the last few days it was just raining um, and we're in February. <laughs> um, uh, I could say that anything that kind of affects the household or the room kind of affects the environment on the inside. Um, with things turning off on you or things not working when you're away from it, I mean, for that same reason, that's why I have cameras within my tents. I keep an eye on them 24-7. Uh, it's almost like... I wish I had a camera on my kid for that same reason. Put a camera on top of her head so I know what she's doing this whole time. I wouldn't have to worry so much. But <laughs> these are other kids that can't fend for themselves and, and, and get sick if something touches them wrong. So um, it, it's definitely a hobby and it, it uh, puts yourself in a position to be more caring or more observant to things that, that you want to you know, love and pay attention to. Especially if you get to, you know, you get to have your cake and eat it too at the end. Um, and it goes across the board with all plants. You know, who, who doesn't like uh, an apple from their own tree? Uh, 
let me see here, but you know, with these uh, these ideas of things walking into the problems, uh, the things that you want to you know most worry about things are things that are out of your hands. If you have things running automatically, then you can have like you know a slight you know slight weight lifted off your shoulder because you know it's working. The cameras help a lot because I can pay attention from from a distance, um, especially if I can hear things running. I'm like okay, that's a good sign. If all of a sudden I get a notification that my camera is off or it's not working, either somebody's robbing me or <laughs> or or my stuff all turned off and I'm going to come back to a quiet room and then you know, I don't have to figure it out. And, and when you're away, it's probably because you're out like doing something or you know it's at night. So when you come home, it's like it's at the end of the day and you have to deal with a whole bunch of stuff. So that that's kind of the the nightmare you don't want to walk into or expect when. When having a, an automated system, you know, that's supposed to work on its own. But uh, you can you can keep away from all that stuff by foreseeing it. Imagine it before you're doing your build. Like uh, I'm definitely gonna not gonna have any leaks ever because I, I triple double check my 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 water sources and, and make sure that it flows in the right places. Uh, I put high pressure on it on on the tubes uh, with a hose to make sure nothing comes out. Um, just triple double checking your stuff it will definitely keep you out of the realm of having to worry about it but always that thing in the back of your head like it's going to happen <laughs> it, no one is, is uh, come on, uh, safe from you know mishaps it's, it's like the law of life <laughs> uh, where I mean even if you're running through soil there's, there's always something that, that could you know surprise you through pests or, or or, you know, lacking management, uh, weather conditions, things that you're not, you're not sure that you can expect when you come back from, you know, whatever you're doing. But uh, personally, I, I maybe have like a water phobia but, uh, of it being everywhere. Um, it's the fact that there's a lot of electronics around it. it it's, it's like playing with fire eventually. I can see how that could be scary for some people, for sure. But the camera thing that you mentioned is a pretty good idea of, you know, listening to the camera to see your equipment still kind of sounds like it's still on, you know? I don't have cameras in my grow yet. I'm looking to actually put cameras in my grow. What cam what brand do you use? Actually, um, I, I use these Blink cameras. Um, they're not too expensive. I'm pretty sure you can find them like 25 bucks a pop. And then you can get some mounts um, from Amazon and where you can kind of angle them as you please. And within my two two by fours, I, I have them pointed down and I have a full coverage where I can kind of zoom in and out. It has two way sound so you can hear the sound coming back out. And you can imagine if there was somebody else in your room, you can talk to them and they can talk back as well. Um, it's, it's great on surveillance. I mean, to be honest, when I first purchased my house, surveillance was a big deal. So I covered my house in like ring cams and I found these blink cameras on the way over. I'm like, hey, these are inexpensive. Pop them to my tents, and you know, I can watch everything. I mean, eyes on, eyes on me, <laughs> vice versa. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get cameras going in my tent soon. Well, we talked about quite a bit here in this talk today in regards to DIY and hydroponics. Let's wrap things up. Tell the listeners how they can find you. And is there anything upcoming in the future that you have going on that you want to talk about? You can always kind of catch me on um, Instagram or. Or even YouTube, uh, I go by highly motivated, highly motivated hydroponics, um, Mr. Nice Guy. If anything, uh, YouTube and Instagram. Uh, if anything, my, I have future girls coming up trying to find a, a new mother to uh, move over into the next tent. Um, you know, this this hunt is always the biggest thing between any kind of like a gardener between whatever cultivar, but. Trying to find the best uh, best one and, and keep them moving is, is kind of the idea right now. Not much tech update, to be honest. I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of settled where I'm at. But if anything new comes out, I'm, I'm definitely going to be on top of it. Um, for the most part, I, I like a lot of the, the brands that I'm using: AC Infinity, Kavita. I mean, they're they're pretty great and consistent. I can't say there there's anything the matter with them, but you know, watch out for my my videos and my posts, and you can see some updates and where I'm going out with it, and hopefully it expands and kind of enjoy the videos or the content, you know. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely have a link to Mr. Nice Guy's channel down in the YouTube description section below, so you guys can easily navigate to that. And if you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, just search for him, Highly Motivated Hydro. His channel should pop right up, and then you'll be able to tune into his content. 
Mr. Nice Guy, thanks so much for coming on today and talking about hydroponics and DIY. Uh, I definitely learned a few things myself. Uh, I'm just getting into DWC. So uh, there's definitely some things here in this talk that I'm going to either takeaways for me. And uh, I might actually hit you up with some additional questions behind the scenes if, uh, if I have any. So thanks so much and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. No, thank you, man. I'm glad to be here. Hope I'll talk to you back then. Thanks a lot, man. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.